Now, I'm going to start the same way this morning as we've been starting with each one of these uh, sermons on the book of Revelation. I'd like to begin by reminding us of the most important thing we're going to learn as we study the book of Revelation. I want to make sure that we get this down. If we don't get anything else in our study of this book and we get this, we have got what is most important from the book of Revelation. First, there is a Lamb's book of life. No question about it, it's there. God himself told us that it is. Secondly, if our names are written in the Lamb's book of life, we'll get to spend eternity in heaven. Thirdly, if our names aren't written in the Lamb's book of life, we're going to hell. You can count on it. Because we know that the first three are unarguably true, the fourth one becomes our reality. We need to make sure that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. That we have given our hearts to Jesus. That we have a personal relationship with him. That we're a part of the family of God. If you've got that, who cares if it's premillennial, postmillennial, all-millennial, or pan-millennial. It'll all pan out in the end. Who cares about all those things if you know that you're ready for Jesus' return? Because if you're ready, no matter how it unfolds, you'll go home to be with Jesus forever. So get that if you get nothing else from our study of the book of Revelation. With that understood, let's dig into today's text in Revelation chapters 5 through 11. Obviously, I can't read chapters 5 through 11 and expect to get done in six weeks. So I gave you homework last week. Now let's check. How many of you did your homework and read in advance? That's good. That means that you're going to get a lot out of this because you already have read what's in there. And I'm going to kind of highlight for you how we can anticipate these things unfolding here in the book of Revelation. I titled this morning's message, What is to Come? Part number one. Let's pray as we get started this morning. God, I want to say thank you for this opportunity. I love sharing your word with people. I ask that in your time, you will open a church and provide for us a ministry in the area around our children and grandchildren. Until then, give me the strength to function in the hardware store as you would have me to function as an example for you. We ask you, Lord, that your word will touch hearts this morning, that your spirit will work and speak through me, and that your spirit will work in the hearts of those who hear your message, and that because of our time with you today, we'll be drawn ever closer to you so that we're ready whenever we Stand before you. We're ready to hear the words, well done, my good and faithful servant. Be with us now, dear Lord. Bless this service in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, having titled the message this morning, uh, What is to Come? Part 1. Let me do this thing here. If you let it go for too long, it decides not to uh, not to, to go any farther. Okay, There's no one that can be found in all of heaven and on all of earth, at least John doesn't think so, that has the ability to open this scroll that's about to show up here in this particular passage of Scripture. There is this scroll that's being handed down from heaven by God to John, and on it is seven seals. And he's looking at it, and he's thinking to himself, there is no one, no one that I know of who can tear those seals off of there and do it without retribution. This is God's scroll. This sealed scroll is but one of a series of end time judgments that are about to be laid out right there in front of John. The seven seals are described in Revelation chapters 5 to 8, if you're looking for where we are right now. In John's vision, these seven seals are they're just securely fascinating. Now, you have to understand the way they do it. They would roll it up so that you would undo one, and a part of the scroll would unroll roll and then you would undo another and another part would unroll and you would undo another and another part would unroll this is an amazing feat of art in and of itself as they made these scrolls this scroll has writing on both sides of it signifying the extensive nature of the pending judgment this is a big thing that's happening this scroll is a major event as each seal is broken a new judgment against the wickedness of mankind will be unleashed on the earth. And it's going to be terrifying. It's going to be terrifying to see how things unfold. If the scroll couldn't be opened, if no one was found worthy to break those seals, then the wickedness would not be judged and evil would continue to infect the earth. That's why John was so saddened when he thought no one could break the seals. 
This reality brought John to tears. He was overwhelmed at the fact that this evil could just go on and on and on. Isn't that kind of how we feel today when we look at the world around us? How long, God, before you bring judgment on this mess that we call the world today? How long are you going to tarry? But it doesn't take long for the angels themselves to reveal that there is one who is worthy to unleash God's judgment on mankind. There is one who is completely worthy. It's the lion of the tribe of Judah. It's the root of David who triumphed over sin, who triumphed over death. Jesus' victory on the cross of Calvary through his death and his burial and his resurrection gives him every right to unlock the seals, open the scrolls, and cast the judgment of God upon mankind for the evil that's taking place in the world. The seven horns and seven eyes are symbolic of Jesus' perfection. He's the perfect Lamb of God. His blood was shed for our sins. <laughs> These seven sealed judgments. I got news for you folks. They are just the beginning of what God's got in store as the end times begin to unfold before mankind. There are other judgments to follow. The, the trumpet judgments, the bowls or the vials of God's wrath. When you get there, it's going to be completely overwhelming. Jesus, the Lamb of God, begins to open up the seals that are wrapping this scroll, holding it tightly together. Each time a seal is opened, the scroll is able to just be unrolled a little bit more, revealing what's about to take place. And as it's unrolled, it gradually reveals the judgments of Almighty God that are to be meted out during the end time tribulation. The book of Revelation is laying out before us what we can expect as the end of times rolls around. Now, the first four of the seals contain a view of four horsemen, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. We often see them depicted in movies and in, in, in billboards and other things. The four horsemen of the apocalypse. Each of these four judgments appears symbolically as a distinctively colored horse and rider coming onto the scene. Each will bring devastation in the wake of their ride across the earth. The first seal, when it's open, it introduces one who claims that he will usher in worldwide peace. Look at me riding on a white horse. I'm coming to bring peace to the world. How often have we heard that over the years? I think we're going to continue to hear it. Even more as we near the end time. If you will put the UN in power, we will bring worldwide peace. If you will put me in charge of the UN, we will bring worldwide peace. Or more likely, if you will put Islam and Catholicism together in Islam, we can bring worldwide peace and harmony. You kind of see what's beginning to unfold as we near the end time. People are going to be crying out for peace and for safety. They're going to be longing for peace and for safety. And someone's going to step up and say, I'll give it to you if you'll follow me. From the biblical description, we can gather several details from this writer. He's depicted as one riding on a white horse, presenting a persona of, look at me. I'm gentle and I'm mild and I'm coming to bring peace and unity and harmony and love and flowers and joy and bluebirds. I mean, you get the, the picture? He produces a persona of peace, but this peace is only a pipe dream. It's not really what he wants at all. He has much more sinister plans in store. He'll come to power under the pretense of bringing peace to the world. I'm guessing this deceiver will be leading an organization that will give him his authority and power. So the whole world will look at him and say, look, he's doing for us all that we desire. He's bringing peace and harmony. He'll be given a crown, which indicates that he will exercise great universal authority. People will look to him for guidance and direction. But he also holds a bow. You know what I'm talking about? Bow and arrow? He holds a bow which shows his true intentions. His true intentions are not peace. His true intentions are not harmony. This imposter of peace is really bent on worldwide conquest and worldwide domination. Have you ever heard of a group that says to the world, 
Look, our name stands for peace. Trust us. Follow us. You heard of Islam? And they're trying to just join forces right now with Catholicism. And they're coming up with this new group called Chrislam. Keep an eye on it, folks. I'm telling you, you better keep an eye on it because we are near the end of times. The second seal. When the Lamb opens the second seal, great warfare breaks out across the earth. No longer is it peace and safety, but the true colors are being revealed and the color is red. This is symbolized by a rider with a large sword and a fiery red horse. This horseman will usher in a time of literally worldwide war. And I don't believe America is going to escape the horrors of war this time. I believe it will be on our soil as well as the soils in distant lands. The horrors of war will become a reality for the entire planet, if you will. America will not be spared from the devastation. It will be a worldwide devastation. Our farmland will be turned into wasteland. And that's going to make a lot of hungry bellies around the world. The third seal, the breaking of the third seal, it causes horrible famine. I mean, when you burn up all the farmland, when you reap nothing because war has devastated the fields, suddenly the breadbasket of the world is gone. People begin to starve. The rider that John sees is riding on a black horse, holding a pair of scales in his hands. And then John hears a declaration. He's told that people will have to work all day just to earn enough money to buy enough food to keep body and soul together. That's the picture being painted here as this horseman begins to unfold the devastation he brings. The devastation of war has made it impossible to raise crops. The world is facing starvation and a hunger in a way that it never has before. And that brings us to the fourth seal. The fourth seal is opened and John sees a pale horse. A pale horse with a rider on it. A rider whose name is Death. And Hades was following close behind him, we're told. The results of this fourth seal is that one-fourth of the earth's population is killed by sword, famine, plagues, and wild beast. Death is running rampant around the world. Death literally is taking its toll on mankind. And that brings us to the fifth seal. This brings us to the fifth seal that contains no horse imagery. Everything else has been a different color horse with a rider on it. This one is changing gears, so to speak. We go from the four horsemen to this fifth seal, which contains no horse imagery at all. Instead, it points us toward those who will be martyred for their faith in Christ during this period of tribulation. There will still be people standing for Christ. There will still be pre people preaching Christ. And as a result, there will still be people dying for Christ. And they're going to be in heaven under the altar crying out, how long are you going to put up with this mess on the earth, dear God? How long before you bring judgment to these people? Their souls, the souls of these martyrs are pictured as dwelling in heaven itself. God hears their cries for justice and he gets each of them a white robe. In essence, he says, here, put this on and wait patiently with me. Wait patiently with me because the fact is, the full number of those who are to be martyred has not yet been reached. There are many more who will die just like you have died for your faith before the end is to come. They must die first and then the judgment will come. God says, I will avenge you. I will avenge you, but the time for vengeance is not yet up on us. You've got to wait a little while longer. I know we're going fast, but that's the only way to get her done. It's six weeks. The sixth seal. When the Lamb of God opens the sixth seal, there's devastating earthquakes. Can you imagine? We just had that little earthquake and look at the damage done over at the Baptist church. Just a little teeny tiny earthquake. Imagine one that shakes the very core of the earth. An overwhelming earthquake. It causes massive upheaval. Terrible devastation as World cities and towns and houses are completely demolished. 
When you don't have any place to live any longer, you start looking for places to go. And you start going to someone else's house, someone else's ruins, someone else's city, someone else's town. All at once there's upheaval all over the world because destruction has come upon the earth. This ushers in unusual astronomical phenomenon, if you will. The sun turns black, the moon turns blood red, and the heavens seem to recede like a scroll being rolled up. Everything is changing. The world is not like it used to be anymore. These things are coming as we march boldly into the end time future. I think the very near future. We're told that every mountain and island was removed from its place. In essence, when everything was shook, the, the mountains fell down. The islands were brought in and covered up as everything just switched and turned upside down in the world, if you will. Survivors of the sixth seal judgment, regardless of their social position, take refuge in caves and they cry out to the mountains and the rocks. They say, just, just fall on us. Just get this over with. We're scared to death. We're overwhelmed. We're terrified at what's taking place in the world. We don't want to be a part of it anymore. Bring an end to us. They want to be hidden from the very face of him who sits on the throne. They're terrified of the wrath of the Lamb that's unfolding before them. The day of God's wrath has come, and as a result, every man is trembling, literally, in his boots. <coughs> After the six seals open, and these things are revealed, there's a short pause. It's here that John's told God's been limiting the destruction. <laughs> this is limiting. The Can you imagine what it would have been had he not been limiting it? This sounds overwhelming to me, but God says, you haven't seen anything yet. I've been limiting it. I've been waiting so that the 144,000 could be sealed. The angel from God comes and he seals the foreheads of 144,000. First mentioned back, remember, in Revelation chapter 7, verses 1 to 8. We looked at that before. It seems that these are Jews who've accepted Jesus and who are now to become end time evangelists. They've given their life to God. They've accepted Jesus as the Messiah, their Savior. And now they're preaching the good news of salvation to all the world during this time of tribulation. And their preaching seems to have been very, very effective. Because God opens the doors of heaven for John and he looks up into heaven. And he looks there and there's numbers that no one could count. They're from every nation and every tribe and every people of the world. The work of these Jewish evangelists seems to have been extremely effective. As they begin to reach out with the gospel of Jesus Christ. This horde of believers is standing before the throne and before the Lamb. These people wear white robes holding palm branches and shouting salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. You, you getting a mental picture of what's going on here? The angel tells John that this white clad multitude is made up of those who have come out of the great tribulation. They were in the tribulation. Now they have died. They have gone to heaven. They're awaiting the end and the judgment yet to come. These are the ones who've washed their robes and made them white, get this, in the blood of the Lamb. Through that act of grace, purchased on Calvary once for all by Jesus himself. They're given a promise. They're told that they're never going to go hungry again. Remember how the devastation made it where people were starving? They're never going to be thirsty again. They are in the arms of Almighty God. The sun will not beat down on them anymore, nor will the scorching heat overwhelm them. God will wipe every tear from their eyes. What a beautiful promise. And that brings us to the seventh seal. When the lamb opens the seventh seal, now get this, it basically brought heaven to its knees. It says there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. They peered upon what was written on the pages of that scroll and heaven itself was horrified. The judgments that lead to the close of the tribulation are now visible inside the scroll and heaven itself is silenced by what they see. These judgments are so severe that this solemn silence marks the overwhelming events about to come. Let me show you what that would have been like.
Can you imagine that for half an hour? Standing back completely overwhelmed by what you've seen? Silence in heaven itself. The seventh seal introduces the next series of judgments. John immediately sees seven angels who are handed seven trumpets. You know, the trumpets, you've heard of those things before? They stand there ready to sound the trumpets of God over the earth. An eighth angel takes a censer and he burns incense in it. And we're told that this incense represents the prayers of God's people going up to God himself. And then everything begins to break loose. That eighth angel takes that censer, fills it with fire from the altar, and he hurls it down to the earth. John heard peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning. He felt a huge earthquake. Once the seven seal judgments are finished, the next part of the tribulation featuring the seven trumpets of judgment is ready to begin. It's ready to unfold. It's at the door. And that brings us to Revelations chapters 8 through 11, if you're trying to follow along. In this section of scripture, John depicts what he sees in the vision of the spiritual realm. He's looking out over the things that God's showing him. The first trumpet sounds. It's going to bring hail and fire mixed with blood. It says one third of the world's remaining trees are burned up in this plague. And all the earth's grass is consumed. You think there was a famine before. Literally it's wiping out much of what's been left by the first devastations. As a result, food shortages that were already severe will become even more pronounced. People will be starving everywhere. The second trumpet will sound. This trumpet brings something like a huge mountain all ablaze, an asteroid, if you will, that's thrown into the sea. And a third of the sea turns to blood. A third of the ships sink, making it impossible to carry what cargo is available from place to place. A third of the ocean life dies. Fishing will no longer be an option. Things are getting worse and worse and worse. The world's oceans are all messed up. When fishing industry is wiped out, food shortages will become even worse than they have been. It's a real mess out there. And that brings us to the third trumpet. This trumpet brings a great star called Wormwood that falls to the earth. It's an asteroid much like the first one described. Wormwood, a shrub-like plant that's extremely bitter, bitter and, and poisonous, begins to pollute all of... Now get this. It's no longer the oceans. It's much like the asteroid, the, the thing that fell from heaven into the ocean. But this time, this time it pollutes all the fresh water of the world. People need water to live. And they're trying to find some way to get water to drink. And yet the water is messed up by this asteroid that comes blazing like a torch to the earth. This third judgment, a lot like the second judgment, affects not the salt water, but the fresh water. This gigantic asteroid will bring about great shifts in the earth's Teutonic plates. Can you just imagine it shaking the whole earth as it hits and the earth begins to have its Teutonic plates move. And that allows the lava from belief to begin working its way up and to begin to see volcanoes springing up around the world that you never saw before, filled with, filling the air with soot. And remember Mount St. Helens and how whenever it erupted, just one volcano, and we saw the, the cloud of dust way over here as it began to make its way across the United States and on around the world. Imagine if that's happening over and over again around the world as this asteroid shakes the earth and breaks apart the Teutonic plates. The soot will begin to rise. The from these eruptions will change the sky as we know it. By now, the food shortages have reached horrific proportions. Starvation is absolutely running rampant. And that brings us to the fourth trumpet. This trumpet brings about changes in the heavens. A third of the sun, a third of the moon, a third of the stars go dark. I think from the soot that the asteroid strike in this aftermath, if you look at realistically how you can understand that in today's scientific terms, as a result, as a result, a third of the day and of the night goes without light from heavens. Can you imagine waking up and it's still dark outside? It's like living up in Alaska for six months out of the year. Except now it's in Indiana. It's in Ohio. It's in Kentucky. It's in Illinois. Imagine the darkness. 
At this point, John tells us about a warning given by an eagle flying through the air. He begins to cry out, whoa, 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 to the inhabitants of the earth. As if it wasn't already time to be feeling woe. He says, woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of earth because the trumpet blasts are about to be sounded by the other three angels. You think it was bad before. In essence, you ain't seen nothing yet. For this reason, the fifth, sixth, and seventh trumpets are often referred to as the three trumpets of woe. Revelation unfolding before our eyes. The fifth trumpet begins to sound. This trumpet is the first of the trumpets of woe, if you will. This trumpet begins with a star falling from the heavens. But this one seems to be different than the others. The others seem to be physical in nature. This one seems to be more spiritual in nature. This time, I'm guessing it represents an angel because he's given the key to the shaft of the abyss and is later called the destroyer angel. The destroyer angel, if you will, of the abyss. He opens the abyss, hell itself, if you will, the dark place, the place of, of no return. And he releases a horde of locust-like creatures. Can you imagine these locust-like creatures begin to spread out over the whole earth? They look like horses prepared for battle, but the description, the description is just plain creepy. They wear something that looks like a crown of gold, and their faces are vaguely human. And they've got hair like women's hair coming down flowing from their heads. They've got teeth like the teeth of lions. They've got breastplates. Their wings sound like the thundering of many horses and chariots rushing into battle. Hal Lindsay put a face on this. If you've ever read any of his work, it can be terrifying. These locusts have stingers in their tail, just like scorpions. These bugs from the pit of hell fly around stinging people. Now get this. Stinging people who have refused to believe in Jesus or, refi- or receive Jesus' seal. In essence, this is the people of the world that's rejected Christ. It's running around stinging all of them. These evil bugs attack and torture the unsaved, it says, for five months. They're not allowed to mess with plant life, as if there's a lot of it left anyway. By now, very few plants are left alive. They heard straight, they head straight for the people of the earth who've not got the seal of God on their foreheads. They inflict such pain and such agony with their sting that the folks who get stung just want to curl up in the fetal position and die. But you know what? They can't. They can't curl up and die. Death eludes them because these nasty bugs aren't allowed to kill anyone. They can only sting and torture them. We're told that these demonic locusts have a king, the angel of the abyss. In Hebrew, his name is Abaddon. In Greek, it's Apollyon, meaning destroyer. Now that in and of itself is just plain creepy, but it sure seems to fit because he makes a real mess of everything on this earth. Are you getting the picture? Are you getting what's being unfolded for us here in the book of Revelation? That brings us to the sixth trumpet, This is the second trumpet of woe, if you will. This trumpet brings on an onslaught of another demonic horde. When this trumpet sound, a voice is heard from the altar of God himself. This voice calls for the release of the four wicked angels. You get that? Wicked. Not friendly at all, but wicked angels. These angels have been bound at the Euphrates River, awaiting the day when they would be released by God to to wreak havoc on the world. Their goal is to wreak destruction and to bring about great terrifying tribulation during the end of times. These four wicked angels lead a supernatural cavalry of thousands upon thousands. They kill a third, it says, a third of humanity, a third of the people that are remaining on the earth. The riders have breastplates of fiery red, dark blue and yellow. It even describes them in a way that's terrifying. Their horses had the heads of lions and out of their mouth came fire and smoke and sulfur. If you're not terrified by now, you ought to be. Because that's what's going to be happening as we near the end of times. Their tails look like snakes, we're told. They kill with their mouths and they kill with their tails. They can get you coming and going, so to speak. Here's the crazy thing. In spite of all the things that we've just heard about, In spite of all the things that are unfolding, 
all the plagues that have happened, people are still refusing to repent and turn to God. They continue in their idolatry. They continue in their murder. They continue in their sorcery. They continue in their sexual immorality. They continue in their thievery. And after the revelation of the plagues of the sixth trumpet, John sees an angel descend from heaven. <coughs> he has a little bittersweet scroll in his hand. He looks at John and he says, John, I want you to eat this. It tastes sweet, but it's going to turn sour in your stomach. And I'm thinking, why do you want to eat that? Well, because the angel told you to, so John takes it and he eats it. He's told that the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, but that his work isn't finished yet. He says, John, you've still got more to prophesy. You've still got more to write down. Remember, he's writing down the words of Jesus. It's not John's word, it's Jesus' words. And Jesus has got more to say, so John's got more to write. John's given a description of two witnesses who will preach in Jerusalem and perform miracles before they are murdered in the streets of that great city. A few days later, God will raise them back to life. And God will take them to heaven and everyone will know they were serving him. And that brings us to the seventh trumpet. This is the third and final trumpet of woe, if you will. When it sounds... John hears a loud voice in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and the kingdom of his Messiah, Jesus Christ. He'll reign forever and forever and forever. Have you got the picture? Jesus wins. The 24 elders declare that the time's come to destroy those who are destroying the earth. They've wreaked havoc long enough. God is going to take a stand and he's going to wipe them out. Obviously, God's about to wrap things up once and for all. The temple of God is opened in heaven. And John looks inside and he sees the Ark of the Covenant in the temple itself in heaven. Lightning flashes. Thunder begins to rumble. You can feel the shaking inside of your innermost parts. Peals of thunder, earthquakes, severe hailstorms. In essence, this trumpet is making a huge impact. Thus, the end of the seven trumpets of judgment has arrived. All is said for the seven angels with the seven bowls of God's wrath. You think it was bad before? You think all of this sounds horrible? You ain't seen nothing yet. When we get together again, we're going to see these bowls poured out upon the earth. These angels stand inside the now open temple ready to step forward and bring God's final judgments on the earth. The time of repentance now get this, has come to an end. Up until now, people could still turn to God. People could still find hope. But the time of repentance has come to an end. These angels are ushering in the overwhelming judgment of God up on the earth. But before they do, God's going to introduce seven symbolic personages. Seven symbolic personages, and that is where we'll pick up when we get together again. Here's what I want you to know. Next week, Kim and I are going to be going to our youngest daughter's wedding. She's getting married off, and someone will be filling in for us here. In fact, he's here this morning. Uh, so we are encouraging you to come and allow him to speak to you and share with you. We will pick up right where we are and uh, continue with our study of Revelation. I only had six, six weeks to, to cram all the book of Revelation, so we are going fast. And it's a lot of material. It's just an overview. You need to study it for yourself. You need to dig in. And you need to understand that it's your responsibility to understand God's word. It may not be easy, but he promises if you'll read it, you're going to be blessed just for reading it. So take time to read the book of Revelation. Before we get together again, make sure you read that next section of scripture so that we're ready to pick up and continue on with our study in the book of Revelation. Right now, though, we're going to close with the old hymn, Just As I Am. If you're outside of Jesus Christ, you want to have your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life, there's no better time than now to get her done. Come on up and begin your personal relationship with Jesus just as you are and allow him to make you all that you can be. Won't you stand and sing with us just as I am? Just as